Welcome to this PLOS webinar on the topic of preprints. My name is Dan Morgan, and I'm the Director of Communications and Community Relations here at PLOS. Thank you for joining us for this next hour of conversation and discussion about some of the first principles of preprints, where we'll attempt to address and, as appropriate, demystify current conversations around preprints. While we did ask certain questions to pique your interest in advertising this webinar, such as, are preprints bad for science? From the outset, we want to make clear that PLOS is entirely supportive of preprints and sees them as an important element in the continuum of research communication, the developing, developing modes of peer review, and a way of improving inclusion in science. And we'll be giving more details as we discuss further. Um, I would like to introduce the, my fellow panelists, um, Dr. Rafaela Bosurgi, who is the executive editor of PLOS Medicine, Dr. Marcel Laflamme, who is the open research manager here at PLOS, and Lindsay Morton, who is the Senior Manager of Open Science Community Engagement. We'll each, we'll each be giving some brief prepared remarks on a key statement or topic related to preprints. Once we've all gotten through our quick remarks, we'll discuss and ask each other questions about the topics and also tackle the questions asked in advance on Twitter and which you can ask during the session. To ask a question, please do so on Twitter using the hashtag first principles of preprints um, or use the Q&A function here. Um, Twitter will be monitored as will the questions uh, by our admin. So thank you very much for that, Damon, in the background. Okay, so without further ado, I'll start and proceed with my prepared remarks. Um, the statement that I'm gonna be tackling today is uh, preprinting maximizes the availability of research for peer review by a diverse set of stakeholders. So, um, I think this is a very important first principle of preprints that is often overlooked or misunderstood when people have concerns about the peer review status of a preprint. The way I would put it is this. One of the roles that preprints play is to maximize the availability of research for peer review. So to say that one of the problems of preprints is that they propagate or circulate non-peer reviewed research it seems very odd to many of us because it is the circulation of non-peer reviewed research that is one of the most important points in that context. I would say then that preprinting is about making research open for scrutiny and peer review feedback in a way that is not. So preprints are about increasing the chance of quality rather than any lack of quality at that particular moment. Preprinting is about being open at a point where things are usually closed and reaping the benefits of increased rigor that can come from that. Some of, the other some of the other benefits of this is that we are aware that there are eager peer reviewers in the world asking to be invited to peer review. Those of us who have managed journals or been editors know that one of the clearest reasons to invite a reviewer is if you know they have previously done good peer reviews. But how do you get started in peer review if you've not done one before? Now, no one is saying that existing peer reviewers shouldn't be used, but opening up the availability of research via preprints for peer review seems like an excellent way to allow eager reviewers to practice, to get started, to perform peer reviews, and to build up a portfolio of activity that they can use when they seek to join an editorial board or otherwise get a more formal reviewing or editorial role. In addition to these eager reviewers, uh, preprints can also be useful for covering as many bases of expertise as possible to properly analyze articles that are extremely multidisciplinary. Integrating preprint commenting while the article is also under review at a journal is one possible solution that we and other publishers have encouraged to address this gap by opening up the opportunity for any researcher anywhere in the world to volunteer their expertise for consideration by the editor. As I said earlier, while commenting on preprints is still in its early stages, it does allow journals to channel the interests and passion of a community wanting to scrutinize new findings before they are published in that community's journals. On the topic of the growth of preprint commenting, my colleague, the Chief Scientific Officer at PLOS, Bernie Kimmer, made a great case in a blog post for Peer Review Week in 2020, which I'll paraphrase. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen researchers rapidly come together after the publication of high stakes results and point out methodological flaws which have led to retractions of articles and withdrawals of those preprints. Social media has been an unconventional yet instrumental tool in coordinated reactions. Some have argued this is a failure of peer review, but we believe it's actually a celebration of peer review in all its different forms. 
So I think that last point is really crucial. Preprint reviews, comments, journal peer reviews, closed or open, are all just peer review in its different forms. Part of the suite of ways review can be done by peers. So I hope you're all getting a picture that preprints are integral to peer review and in many ways not an attempt to sidestep it. Now, I know there's going to be some on this webinar that agree, but then we'll say that the issue is that preprints can be reported, perhaps in the media or social media, and digested as peer-reviewed research when they are not. Now, I know other panellists will touch on this topic, but I'll briefly say this may be so, and I completely agree that non-peer-reviewed research should always be presented as such and reported on as such by what it is. However, any fault in this situation is not the fault of preprinting itself, which to repeat is about maximizing the chance and opportunity for peer review, but a fault in the reporting of that research. So I'll leave my prepared remarks there um, and I'll hand over to my colleague, Lindsay Morton, who will be dealing with this question. Hi everyone, thank you, Dan. Um, so I'm just gonna speak really briefly about how preprinting can allow researchers to make scientific work available on their own terms. Um, so I want to start by just saying preprints are one of a large array of scientific tools used for communicating research in a way that's faster, fairer, more reliable. And, and one of the major characteristics of preprints as a tool is their flexibility and the independence and the control that they give to authors. And that comes into play in a couple of different ways. Um, so briefly, uh, when and if a preprint is posted. So it's something that authors can choose to do for themselves at any point prior to formal publication in a journal. You might choose to post your first draft as soon as it's done uh, before you've submitted it anywhere, maybe because you wanna get feedback earlier as uh, Dan has suggested, maybe because you wanna establish priority for the work. Uh, you might choose to post as many people do at the same time that you submit or even as part of the submission process. You might choose to post after your article has already been under consideration for a while. For example, if there's some delay in the peer review process and you need to show progress for a grant or maybe a tenure application, you may choose not to post at all. And it's, it's really up to you. Um, some funders do encourage preprints and a lot of publishers like FLOSS do offer support to help make preprinting easier. But again, it's really down to the author and what's gonna be best for the research. Um, Another way that this flexibility comes into play is what you post. So for some research, it can be difficult to find the right journal. Uh, if the research spans several disciplines, uh, if it has negative or null results, uh, if you're using perhaps a new or unusual report approach. <laughs> uh, so preprints let authors share research on a searchable platform, and as Dan has kind of discussed already, to receive feedback on it outside of the journal peer review process. Um, similarly, you know, some journals have a very distinct style, uh, very specific guidelines for length, for content, for sections. Preprints can provide kind of an original version, not written for any particular journal, but in the style and at the length that the authors feel best represents the research. And that can be um, quite a gift as well. Uh, and finally, um, preprints open peer review to a wider variety of experts. So a lot of journals rely on their editors' personal networks and databases of past authors in order to help find reviewers. Uh, preprint commenting lets researchers form sort of more organic connections by proactively interacting with other people who share their interests. And for younger researchers, that kind of uh, proactive, uh, empowered commenting can be a great way to gain experience. Um, I think we'll, we'll dive into these issues a little bit more in the question and answer period, uh, but that is briefly um, some of the ways that preprinting can empower authors. Uh, I believe I hand it over to Marcel. Um, Rafael, did, did you want to go next? Yeah, I think I would go after, or you want to go Marcel? I don't understand. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to, to go next then. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Yeah, so the, the piece I want to talk about, and, and I, I think Lindsay alluded to this already, 
Um, is the idea that there are various types of preprints, um, various reasons for preprinting. And I guess one message we want to get across is that um, you know, not every preprint will go on to be formally published, and that's okay, right, from, from, from PLOS's point of view. Um, so, you know, thus far, I think we've, we've mainly focused on the use case for preprints where a published version of record is eventually envisioned, right? We're, we're, we're sharing a manuscript at one point, but we're imagining a, a published journal publication kind of down the road. Um, <clears throat> and I should say, I mean, that is the basis of kind of the, the success measures that we're currently using at PLOS to determine the effectiveness of our own preprint initiatives, right? So to, to, to look at that in terms of our own published output. Um, so, you know, when that happens in that use case, um, it's important for, for publishers, for preprint servers, other infrastructure providers to really cooperate in providing good linking between um, the, the published article and preprints um, to provide, as, as some folks say, um, a record of versions, right? So to, to clearly be able to follow the evolution of, of a manuscript um, from preprint through various versions of the preprint um, and, and on to, to what once upon a time we might have called a, a version of record. Um, you know, studies have looked at kind of similarities and differences between preprints and published articles. Um, there was a, a question. Um, you know, those differences, it turns out, tend to, to, to not be great in, in many cases. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there's also room for automated tools <clears throat> to make these sort of comparisons more routinely available, right? And I think in the future, we can imagine really um, finding ways to, to help readers make those comparisons between different versions of, of manuscripts. So that's something that, you know, that, that we can think about as well. Um, but again, because not every preprint <clears throat> is destined to become a published article, I think we can, we can unpack some of the reasons that researchers might post preprints when, when that isn't the, the trajectory for their manuscript that they're envisioning. Um, and here I'll, I'll kind of highlight the work of our friends over at ASAP Bio. Um, there's a new initiative that they're engaging in, um, which is called Preprints in Progress. Um, so they talk about really expanding the range of work that is shared via preprints. Um, some of the examples that they include, um, they're thinking about early stage results, maybe from a small or pilot set of experiments, um, null results, confirmatory findings, reanalyses, so different types of study design that might never be included in a journal article. Now, you know, I'll interject here to say that PLOS publishes a journal, PLOS One, that, <clears throat> that does publish articles with many of these types of designs, right, that publish null results or replications. So as long as the science is sound, you know, we're, we're happy to consider studies like that um, at, at PLOS One. Um, and, and I would say that as a publisher, we've long challenged the idea that it's only novel or highly impactful findings that deserve to have a published version, right? At the same time, we understand that authors may not want to go through the formal review and publication process for every small piece of research that they do. And so, yeah, we, we fully support the posting of preprints that aren't yet imagined to have a peer-reviewed article as their endpoint, um, while acknowledging that authors might change their mind about that over time, and, and that's okay too. Um, in fact, I, I think it's worth pointing out that we do this ourselves at PLOTS, right? So whenever possible, we share the results of research that we conduct internally at PLOTS to guide our own decision-making. Um, one of my favorite pages on the, on the PLOS website is a page called Research by PLOS, which I can, I can share in the chat a little later. Um, and, you know, for, for us, when we're sharing the results of our own internal research, the kind of minimum version of that that we'll usually use is a preprint, right, that, that will we'll at least do that. 
sometimes will develop those manuscripts further in, into publishable versions to enhance their discoverability and to, to check the rigor of our analysis. But we don't always do this. And sometimes, from our perspective, the preprint is the endpoint. So maybe well, I'll just close by saying that I think the question of how publishers might interact with preprints that aren't tied to a submission to a journal um, is an interesting one. And maybe that's one we can talk more about in, in our discussion. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think there, there is interest in how publishers might go out and, and scout or commission or sort of look for preprints sort of out in the world. Um, my sense is that that's challenging, that with a, a finite amount of editorial time available, it's tough to prioritize screening manuscripts that may never be submitted to a PLOS journal, but it does happen. Um, and you know, I think it's especially likely to happen in areas that have been identified by a journal or by a publisher for growth, right? So whether that's in particular subject areas, particular parts of the world. Um, so yeah, I think this question of, of um, how publishers go about identifying manuscripts that, that, are, that are interesting preprints out in the world, um, but that haven't been proactively brought to the attention of the journal is something that, that is really an ongoing conversation and, and one that I, I think we can open up later in the hour. Um, Raphael, over, over to you. I was muted, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I am going briefly um, to talk about preprint and the media. And I want to like start this brief uh, overview um, by sharing one of the question um, the audience had raised yesterday. And um, the question is from someone from New York University and it goes, uh, what are the effects of preprints on the public perception of science? and the reliability of publicly reported science. So that's uh, that's a very like uh, a good question, a helpful question for me to really start talking about uh, how the perception of uh, of science might um, to the public in the public might change as a result of uh, uh, preprints. So we have to think that when um, a research articles. Um, is published. The findings are picked by um, government reports, you know, talk show, news stories, um, press releases from academic institutions or industry institution. Um, and very often they fail to report the findings in a in a good way. So failures are um, have obviously um, kind of uh, heavy consequences, conse consequences. And um, failure on communications uh, include, for example, focusing on single center studies without contextualization of other studies, um, over interpretation of results and lack of taking into account limitation of the studies. And, uh, um, drawing conclusion on um, reports and studies that haven't been reviewed. Examples of those issues, for example, an example of th these issues is the is a small clinical trial study that was published after um, I think six days after WHO had declared a pandemic, and it was about the potential beneficial effect of hydro hydroxychloroquine um, on, 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 COVID, um, on COVID. And, and obviously what happened in that case is that a day after the study had been deposited on meta archives, um, it was published. Even though MedArchives had warned that the findings hadn't been peer reviewed, um, that small studies had guided clinical practice in a wrong way because within weeks, bigger trials had been published and the result of the small trial proved to be wrong. So, what I'm trying to say is that uh, preprints are 
if on one hand preprints are really good because they accelerate dissemination of findings, they really urge caution and the way the findings are communicated to the public. So just to just to make clear to, to, to you how the system worked before preprints really arrived, at least in the health science field. And you know, the system still works in that way. You know, so you have a paper that is published and then it's press release. And a press release is uh, written, drafted by the press team at the journal by editors and is reviewed by authors. Now this press release is under embargoes. That means that it cannot be like distributed um, to, to the public before the article is published. During this time is the, is anyway, it's distributed to registered journalists who have time to read the paper because they have full access to the paper. They read the press release and they have a chance to get in touch with the corresponding author. So they really have time to understand what the paper is about and to come up uh, once the paper is published with, with a story that it should be um, calibrated and equilibrated. Now with preprints, what happens with preprints? That obviously preprints, someone has actually, you know, raised a question uh, whether or not journalists can really have access to those preprints. Yes, preprints are posted on uh, servers uh, and can be accessed by anyone. So what happens is that a journalist sees a preprint and make a story out of it. And, you know, he makes to the front page of national newspaper, Daily Mail, New York Times, The Guardian. Now, the critical point here is that once the news are reported, they cannot be unreported. So once the news is out, is out. And by the time that preprint will make to a publication, if the publication will prove to uh, we will we, we actually um, have findings that are different from the preprint one. By that time, the damage will have been caused already. So how obviously do we tackle that? You know, how do we make sure journalists really understand that those are articles that haven't undergone peer review? How do we make sure the authors on the same hand inform the media why they're sharing their study as a preprint? And in addition to that, we need to make sure that the public knows the difference between a published paper and a preprint. And I think the media, the public find out for the first time what a preprint was uh, in, in, a, in, I think, March the 20th in 2020, when WHO declared the pandemic and these more studies about the beneficial effects of hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine was published because it was really uh, a big thing. So I think one thing journalists should start doing is to uh, understand what the limitation of a study is, get in touch with the authors and ask what really are those findings telling the public. And, um, and the authors should get in touch with the journalists and they, sh they should really let them know why they're sharing the preprints, the, the, their research as a preprint, because the reason behind might change. You know, it might be that you have, uh, you have a very, that is, you want to like uh, let the community know that you've been the first one working on that. So different reasons, which I'm not going to really dig into. Perhaps uh, we can uh, expand on that later on. But if a journalist know the reason behind that, can really put in perspective how the stories is communicated out there. Um, and I think I think it's willing really uh, to to ask yourself as an author why do you want to really share your study as a preprint and are you willing to take a risk to have your story covered in a in a in a misleading way I would say uh, or you know it's it's 
I think it's a joint responsibility between publishers, between preprints, between journalists, between editors. And on preprint service, they make clear they have their own selection of, of, of criteria to select studies. They make sure they are not offensive, they are robust in terms of scientific content, they are not, uh, you know, mm. and they make sure, they make clear that their preprint articles are not, have not been peer reviewed. And journalists, on the other hand, have guidelines that they need to follow in order to the preprint service provide journalists with the, with the guidance uh, to on how to communicate about those findings. So I will stop here, but there, there are lots of, 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 um, of uh, points to, to, to discussion, but I would, uh, high, you know, I would reinforce the idea there is a joint responsibility uh, to make sure the public do not perceive science, a uh, preprint as a bad thing, because preprints aren't a bad thing for science. Thank you so much, Raphael, and, and everybody else there. I mean, just to quickly sum up, um, and I'll go in reverse order, we heard Raphael very articulately indicating that it is a joint responsibility for the correct reporting of research, whether it be non-peer reviewed or peer reviewed, um, we have a clearly a culture emerging of preprints. There is nothing we can do about that now. Um, preprints are a thing. They have been a thing for a long time in many fields. And someone was bringing up the case of working papers in previous fields and in the chat there. And so I mean, this is a culture, there's a type of activity that is just going to happen. And we have to jointly figure out the best ways that we ensure the, the the right amount of responsibility on all of the other things that springboard off of um, the reporting of research, such as social media, media and citations. Uh, Marcel talked to us about, um, you know, in, in addition to emerging cultures, that there are some, you know, we are we are observing fields decide what how they want to use preprints. And, you know, we are coming to terms with some people, you know, as much as I was talking about um preprints are circulated to maximize the availability to maximize their availability for scrutiny there are some people that will be very happy with just releasing their work as preprints and we will be importantly studying and, and checking in on that and Lindsay was talking to us about how you know these the preprints are the great opportunity to, to have research really stand for what it is how how would you circulate research if you weren't considering a particular journal that you wanted to um, uh, publish it in um yeah really interesting um and you know brief and articulate kind of expressions of some first principles um we're doing our best to track a lot of the questions in the chat and the q a um, but at the same time we also want to focus on kind of the discussion here um so i'm still seeing a, a lot of questions about kind of media and reporting in the media and the trustworthiness of such research for you know when it's cited in dissertations when it's reported in the media i hope some of the comments you've already heard have gone towards you know addressing some of that um but why don't we kind of just jump in with discussing that very thing you know to, to see where we go and since we heard from rafael primarily about the, the media and um marcel i saw that you had uh shared that um preprint about how journalists actually engage with preprints did you want to give it like a little summary of your takeaway points of that yeah, I'm happy to chime in there. I mean, right, I think one thing that is exciting to see is, is the beginning of some real empirical research on these questions, right, that, that I think much more valuable than conjecture about what journalists might do with preprints or how clinicians might use preprints, right, is really empirical research on, on how, um, these, how these users, in fact, sort of um, make use of, of, of this kind of genre of, of knowledge. Um, yeah, and so the, the study that I linked, um, to, you know, in, in the chat there was, um, was done by a team in Canada. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the two key findings there were that, you know, most journalists um, did approach unreviewed studies with extra skepticism, right? So, so journalists themselves did make that distinction in terms of whether uh, a study had been reviewed or not. Um, and that, that most of the journalists in the study did try to acknowledge 
um, you know, either the context for the preprint and, 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 and to explain a bit about, um, you know, that, that it wasn't on review study, um, or exactly what Raphael the, referred to, the, the limitations, right, in the published article. So, so the journalists really understood this as part of their job in covering science. Um, was to make it clear, um, you know, what, what, how, how to contextualize those findings. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we can think about other ways of, of assessing kind of um, the trustworthiness of preprints as well. And so, you know, I think part of that has to do with, with those sort of notices or disclaimers that might appear um, on preprints and, and on, on the pages, sort of clearly indicating their current review status. Dan, I liked your point about, you know, the, the fact that, that a manuscript hasn't yet been peer reviewed isn't a deficit, right? It's not a problem with the study, but it's a description of the current peer review status um, of the manuscript, which could be updated over time. Um, I'll just also briefly mention, I mean, PLOS is engaged in a, in a, a terrific initiative um, called Review Commons that is really focusing on making reviews of preprints visible on preprint servers themselves. Right, so that's another way to think about, um, you know, to, to help readers of various kinds, right? Whether they're specialists within a field, whether they're they're readers that are that are in other areas or the general public, um, you know, what what kind of information can we put in front of a reader um, to help that reader assess the trustworthiness of of uh, you know of findings? And that depends, of course, on who the reader is, right? On the reader's own ability to do that depending on their own expertise in the field. But I think making things available like, you know, the, the referee preprints that Review Commons works on, the availability of other open science outputs, like um, links to underlying data sets, which many preprint servers sort of ask for as well. Um, you know, I'm quite interested in, in ways of kind of, um, kind of signals of the extent to which a preprint aligns with current consensus in an area or not, and whether there are ways to surface that as well. So yeah, then we can think about these different trust signals, um, you know, on the preprint itself and, and certainly as the media might report on them. I uh, just wanted to add very briefly on this media preprint. I think, I think as I said, uh, and yeah, I totally agree with what Masa said, and also I'd like to stress how you know, uh, a different approach to preprints needs to be really taken and how the role the pu publishers have as well in informing the public of what preprints are. I mean, I've seen lots of questions coming up about what preprints are, where preprints are posted, if everybody, if everybody can access those things. And I think there is still among researchers and among the public a little bit of like confusion about what preprints are, how preprints are accessed and how they are disseminated. And I think the role of publishers here is to really like as we did recently, right, Marcel, we write an editorial about preprints informing, you know, our communities of what preprints are for. And, and so even if when a journalist make out a story out of a you know, some findings shared on, on a, on a, on a, on a preprint server, you know, the public, if the public knows what a preprint is, will, you know, the approach in really absorbing these, these, these notions will be different, will be more kind of equilibrated. And on the other hand, I think journalists that, you know, say that is the media responsibility in how the science of preprints is communicated, it's really unfair. I think, uh, I repeat, it's a joint responsibility and, you know, the way journalists and authors liaise between each other needs to change. Uh, and, you know, um, as I said, preprints are not perfect, peer review is not perfect either. You can have a paper that is published and uh, you can have, uh, you know, that paper being covered by the most important, you know, national newspapers, and then after a year, the paper is retracted or, you know, the results prove to be wrong. So there is no perfect system here. It's a, it's a, it's a joint work between all the stakeholders involved in science communication, I think. Uh, and I mean, whilst all I'm doing here is echoing that point, I really do think it is worth echoing. This notion that we tend to discuss things, not just, you know, research communication, but the world in 
this way is right now this way is right this way had a problem therefore we should pick the other way but that way then had a problem and therefore we should go back to the other way right we can say that because preprints yes it is possible to disseminate you know completely wrong research via preprints because there's less of a check before something can be published but then we also know that in some of the world's top journals you can have very questionable research which peer review did not pick up on so depending on which version we like we'll cite the problem that happened in the uh, you know the opponent's situation but this is i think missing the point we're not no one is saying that preprints solve all the problems of peer review and no one is saying that peer review formal closed peer review in a journal solves all the problem of preprints. I think what those people who support preprints are saying is that this is just a now another new way of maximizing peer review. Some people will never comment on a preprint in their academic lives. And for some people, it's everything that they've ever wanted to do. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really interesting to try and step back from any of these things you know whether it's preprints or you know we could be in another future session be talking about protocols or open data sharing or things like this that nothing is the panacea nothing is the solution for all the problems that you know are in the scholarly communication space we are just observing an uptick in the desire for people to share an early version of a paper for peer review for early dissemination for putting a stake in the ground earlier Yes, we see some potential problems if that research is false or shoddy. But, you know, if if someone really, really wants to kind of do, you know, unethical research, you know, there is there's very few ways to universally stamp that out. So but that's not people didn't invent preprints to, to solve all the problems. They saw an opportunity to share research early and allow research to be commented on in a way that it hasn't been before. So. Also, I'm very strongly making a point that there is, you know, perhaps we should make all the other points less strongly that, um, you know, and ensure that this remains a joint responsibility and that we figure out the ways and the policies and the guidelines and the methods and the platform features that kind of best help the values that we want to remain in science, which is always rigor, robustness, transparency, and, you know, as, as big a reduction as possible of bad and unethical acting. Um, yeah. Dan, I was just going to say briefly too, I mean, I think it's also about sort of seeing preprints as part of a continuum of other practices that researchers use to make early results available, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it, it may be that the fact that the preprint is in manuscript form and looks something like a research article, right, puts it in a, in a, in a different category. But I mean, you know, when researchers share early results in seminars, in conference presentations, in posters, right, those are all forums that have some degree of quality control, right, in the same way as most preprint servers have some, some degree of, of screening, um, but, but often not the sort of full peer review that a journal would engage in, right? And so in a sense, I think, you know, just as something that might be presented at a conference and you know, show up on YouTube and then have a life of its own in, in the world, right? And, and you know, yes, that's um, that's complicated about about research communication today in a way that it wasn't 50 years ago. It's also not specific to preprints, right? I, I think that it, it is part of sort of a broader challenge of of, um, of sifting, and, and and I think it acknowledges that trying to kind of shut down the flow of information and to really kind of um, yeah, to, 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 to disqualify um, ways of, of making research available. I think a more fruitful approach is to say, you know, as these channels multiply, let's help readers really um, thoughtfully and responsibly sift through the information that they encounter. Thank you. If, if you don't mind, uh, Dan, I've just seen a couple of questions about uh, advantages on uh, um, having preprints from the Global South, because this was yeah. raised yesterday as well. Uh, it's something that PLOS is really like sensitive about, you know, really um, uh, publication from, from, from low medium income countries. So I just want to say what, you know, I think the advantages for, for people that are from the Global South are quite uh, um, 
clear. First of all, you know, they have limited funds, uh, the research is normally slower, so obviously preprints uh, does represent a way for them to accelerate the dissemination of their findings, to raise visibility to founders that are based in the global north, um, to enhance collaboration with with the people that work in the same field from high from high income countries and obviously um so preprints in a way represent a saver for for them um and uh, it needs to be seen obviously for those people based in low medium income countries uh you know fees are to publish uh, are high so it might be a good way to really step into into the publication uh, arena in a in a in a in a way that even the research can benefit from a feedback from colleagues and collaborators so i would say that overall it's a, it's a very good thing uh, for for people that are based in the global south I think this notion of getting, you know, we, we focused a lot on the media and uh, that, those questions and the trust. What I'd love to kind of connect and hear more about is, is two of the points made by both Lindsay and Marcel, this notion, and I'm seeing some questions about this too, about, you know, ab about the moment of publishing. Some people have been asking, how long should you leave between preprints and publication? Because we know that there are some behaviors emerging where people will share a preprint before they decided which journal they want to publish in. Um, but then there's some people that like to do it concurrently with journal submission and of course that's something that we offer at PLOS with the, the posting on an author's behalf to various preprint servers and Lindsay was making this point that you know that maybe preprints do represent the ability for authors to have the you know this is how I would actually like to share my research before I even have to follow another journal's guidelines or style guidelines or word limits or this way of like treating figures and then as Raffaella was saying that, you know, maybe, you know, the responsible sharing of quality work via preprint is a way, it's a leveler of people to get access to a global dissemination that wasn't, you know, available before. So Lindsay and Marcel, do you have any kind of thoughts on the behaviors of kind of parallel posting and submission to journals or submission in advance to preprints and follow on post, follow on publication and what, what you're seeing there? Lindsay, do you want to start us off? You know, I, I tend to think that researchers have great instincts when it comes to understanding how their research can be best understood, right? And um, the more that we can honor that as publishers and, and support it, even if it maybe starts outside of our, you know, proprietary journal systems, um, it is a really positive thing. I think somebody in the chat mentioned uh, posters and conference talks and, and are there parallels with uh, preprints there? And I think, you know, there are. Um, those are often pre-peer -pre reviewed, you know, organic expressions of research by researchers to other researchers in the format that they think is gonna be most understood. And, and I think there, there is an analogy to be drawn there, certainly. Um, you know, I think too, a lot of what uh, Marcel mentioned in terms of preprints that maybe are never intended for publication. You know, we used to find those perhaps on individual lab blogs, uh, open notebooks, you know, those types of spaces. And I think what preprints can offer that is um, really valuable is, is centralization, a DOI, and searchability and findability. You know, as a couple of people mentioned, uh, preprints are indexed, um, not just by calling Google, um, which of course any blog would be, um, but um, by Google Scholar as well. And because these are such established platforms, you know, they're getting higher in the search results than an individual labs blog might. So um, in terms of perhaps reducing duplication of effort or unnecessary replication studies, I think there is a real value to centralizing this data in a place where people can find it. And if it turns out that, hey, it's not useful, well, at least it's there. 
Yeah, maybe I would just amplify. I mean, I think Lindsay really started us off with this kind of you know framing of author choice, and I, I think that's one that that is just you know one that, that we take really seriously at, at, at PAUSE. Um, so, right, I mean, to, to Dan's question about sort of, um, you know, posting, uh, uh, you know, for an author to post a preprint on their own months before, you know, quite knowing where, where a, a paper would go, um, you know, versus doing it at the point of submission. I mean, I, I think our, our perspective from, from BLOST is that, that either of those is great, both of those is great, um, you know, that, that the facilitating posting that we offer through PLOS as well as, um, we we give authors the option to transfer preprints to specific PLOS journals um, from from preprint servers like BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, you know that makes our lives a little easier in some ways. That 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 you know it's it's easier to count those and to know where where those are. Um, you know there are other solutions that we're developing to to find others that were where there, there there was that gap in between. Um, but yeah, I think another important point to make, and, and this was a, another question in the chat, I think about, you know, once a preprint has been posted, um, that, that most preprint servers will say that unless um, there is, you know, a, 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 unless something illegal has been posted uh, in the way of a, a copyright violation or, you know, for other kind of rare cases, once a preprint has been posted, um, you know, it, it, it becomes part of the scholarly record, not in the same way that a published article is, but in a way that there's value to having it there um, and, and then having updates to that manuscript right up to the point of acceptance to a journal made through updates and through versioning, right? And so I think the idea of, of posting a preprint and then taking it down later, um, you know, that's something that, that different preprint servers have different policies on. Um, but I, I think it's something that many of the servers that we work with at PLOS say, like, that's not great for science, right? The, the, the decision to make results available early, you know, even if it's technically possible to make those results disappear, and often it isn't, right, because things have been syndicated or, or, or posted elsewhere. Um, yeah, but, but really that it's better to say if an error is found, that's fine. Right, that's that's part of the function of sharing early work, having it criticized and then refining it further. Right, but but making that record of refinement available rather than sort of saying, well, you know, let's let's just um, let's just remove it altogether. My sense is that that many preprint servers have the attitude that update and revision is is a better way to go. And just to add. The preprint one's not necessarily aware you know you still think it's kind of really easy the presumption that it's as easy as posting it on your blog or posting it on facebook or something no i mean to, to upload and to, to engage with a preprint i mean as you are very clear you are inserting something into the scholarly record you know so that's it if you are deliberately trying to propagate bad science as a bad actor you know to post it as a preprint is a pretty bold move you're minting a DOI and essentially ensuring that should you be ever discovered for having done that, it will be very clear that you have done that, right? So it is, it, it kind of, I think sometimes people characterize, you know, pre-printing as kind of some sort of throwaway activity. You are participating in the creation of a scholarly record. Yes, it's... things by machine. Um, I think people are also talking about, you know, what is the best preprint server, you know, like what's the differences between some of them. Um, Marcel, I know you've been studying kind of different preprint servers. And I think I remember a conversation with you saying that we've got to just preprint server and the services it offers that are related to scholarly activity. So what are your comments on that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would say that, um, PLOS's perspective has been one of wanting to, um, when we can, to partner with preprint servers 
um, that 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 clearly have a degree of, of community leadership um, behind them in terms of setting standards, in terms of, of, of deciding what sort of appropriate or what kind of screening might be appropriate. Um, so, you know, PLOS has not taken the approach of, of you know, building a preprint server from scratch or, or um, acquiring a preprint server that we're, we're most interested in partnering with the research communities that, that we exist to, to serve. Um, and, and, and partnering with, with preprint servers that really have emerged as community solutions. And so, you know, right now, BioArchive and MedArchive are, are, two, are two, you know, servers that we feel really good about doing that with. Um, but yeah, I mean, sites for preprint merge. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that there, there are different um, configurations that are possible as people sort of choose where they want their, their um, you know, their, their research to be discoverable. And so it seems like Marcellus, certainly for me, there's some connectivity issues there. So we'll just pause on Marcel's comments and um, was there any anything what did you want to add to what Marcel was saying Lindsay? Yeah I, I would just say um, as Marcel pointed out you know uh, partnering with existing platforms has been you know really successful for, for PLOS. Um, a, a lot of questions uh, kind of bordered on this issue having to do with whether posting a preprint is going to compromise your chances of future publication. Um, and I thought I would just say there's been a real uh, sea change in this area in the last five-ish years, since 2018, 2019 or so. Uh, these days, most um, journals, uh, certainly most publishers will uh, consider manuscripts with preprints, uh, but in cases where there are restrictions, often it has to do with the nonprofit status of the um, preprint server. So um, your archives, your uh, bio archive, your med archive, all of the OSF uh, servers, you know, Earth Archive, Africa Archive, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, if that is a concern for you, there is an excellent list on Wikipedia of uh, policies by publisher, which I think someone shared already in the chat. And if you want to look at specific journals, which within a publisher, certain journals may have a more restrictive preprint policy, uh, the Sherpa database is excellent for that. Um, yeah. Cool. Sorry, I just want to to I'll just mention just on that point about, um, yeah, I mean, Rafaela, as you and I were working on the editorial together, the one that was published in Plus Medicine earlier this month, it was really interesting for me to see that evolution specifically in clinical journals and, and journals in the health sciences. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the way in which by 2020, um, you know, Plus Medicine and 85 of the other top 100 um, So that was news to me, to be honest. I mean, it was it was interesting to see that even in a field that rightly has really emphasized responsible sharing, um, that 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 um, that transition seems to have 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 happened pretty widely. Yeah, I mean, the preprints uh, in health science, medical science, uh, are a relatively new thing, and I think uh, the 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 kind of delay of preprints in clinical medicine and health sciences field is due mainly to the fact that obviously um, wrong research, wrong findings or misleading findings can really pose an arm on or can really represent a risk for, for the human health. And that's why, you know, they're always being kind of uh, um, reluctance here to, 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 to have a relaxed Approach to preprints, but I think uh, um, I think uh, you know many journals are really like uh, starting to realize that preprints uh, are the new way um, of sharing. In 
in a transparent way um, research findings. I mean, many journal, many other journals, like for example, JAMA, the JAMA Network journals in, two, um, in 2018, I think they had a policy according to which if articles had been shared as preprints, they could not be considered, um, they, could not, they could not be submitted to the journal. Then they changed this policy in 2019 uh, as a case-to-case -case determination. And obviously having, uh, according to their policy, having the, the article shared as a preprint does not preclude publication, but authors have to provide uh, an explanation on why they decided to, uh, to, to, to share the articles as a preprint. Um, other major uh, clinical journals, as the Lancet, have introduced preprints. They use the Elsevier preprint server, and uh, and you know, Plus, uh, as we know, uh, launched this initiative to to in recently. Um, so I think uh, I think it's a new thing, and uh, you know I can see a comment from the from from the audience says that you know a peer review is not perfect, but the quality of the research uh, what is it is uh, is definitely higher. We are not saying that preprints uh, has a higher quality than the peer review articles. So we say that is a first step forward. Uh, a, a, a change in mentality on how to build trust among scientists, clinicians, researchers, on how to share science in a in a way that can be constructive, in a way that you know criticism from your colleagues, from collaborators, are not seen as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. The first step towards uh, a, probably a better publication. It, can avoid things, uh, you know, it can avoid, um, you know, as I said, a peer review published article is not perfect. It can be proved to be wrong after a year. Perhaps preprints can avoid errors that can be not spot during the peer review process. Um, so and that applies to clinical medicine as well. As I said, the, the process of preprints and peer review are are not perfect, and uh, um, but I think uh, preprints can make can contribute to make the peer review more functional. I would say. So we're um, approaching the top of the hour, which will mark the end of this webinar. So perhaps it is a good moment for some wrap up comments. I mean. Thank you to everybody that's joined us uh, for the questions. It's a lot of you have joined. So there's been a lot of chat and a lot of questions. We've addressed some of them, but there was absolutely no way we could get to them all. I think this is a, a good example that of what an early stage we are still in. You know, for, for many fields, like preprints have been going for a long time, but for many other people, preprints are something brand new and the cultures and values associated with them. So we hope this is just one part of a discussion that it will continue for a very long time. And we hope that whatever we've said and whatever you agree with, we all agree that we need to share responsibility and choose which of the values in science and scholarly communication we want to ensure shine through in how we deal with preprints. And the final thing I'll say is, I think this is a good moment. Preprints show a good moment that more control can be given back to authors and the scholarly community. I think for a number of years, perhaps in the 20th century and the 21st centuries, scholarly communication felt like existing under rules set by publishers, by funders, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a key thing to ask, not like what's the best way of doing this? What do you want me to do? But ask yourself, how do I, what do I want to use preprints for? Do for this paper versus this paper, would it be useful for me to have comments because you know of a specific element of the paper? So, I, you know, I do encourage everybody to think to yourselves, not what does this mean for me and what do I have to do, but how do I want to use this emerging preprint culture for what it is that I want to achieve as a scientist and as an author. And uh, I, I like the way that many of these open science practices are going in that direction. Any other goodbyes or parting comments from anybody? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if we could not address all interesting questions that you raised. We will make sure to provide a, a brief ex, you know, answers to your questions uh, if, pos if possible. But please feel free to get in touch if you have specific questions with, with us. Yep. 
Thank that you. Hash, that hashtag is still there, so please, please use it. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here.